Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 2 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is Data Mining Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence. As we discussed in lecture 1 of the course, we encounter with the big data that is the data involving a large number of variables as well as a large number of observations in various fields. Uh, we also discussed uh, uh, various fields in which we get such kind of data. Of course, uh, to handle such kind of data, we require different tools, different tools than the classical statistical tools. Uh, data mining techniques involve such kind of tools. Basically, different data mining tools are modern multivariate techniques. So, in this lecture, we will discuss uh, the basic concepts of uh, data mining like predictive and descriptive data mining, uh, scalability, etc. Uh, we will also discuss various applications of the, uh, data mining in different fields. Uh, of course, when uh, we consider data mining, we cannot ignore or we cannot separate uh, the fields like uh, knowledge discovery or artificial intelligence or machine learning. Although the main focus of uh, this course is uh, to discuss uh, different tools of uh, statistical data mining, but uh, in this lecture, I will briefly discuss the basic concepts of artificial intelligence and knowledge discovery. Now, first we consider basic concepts of data mining. The objective of data mining is to acquire knowledge mining from data. We have multivariate data, we have data involving a large number of variables, a large number of observations and your objective is to extract information from the data or to get knowledge from the data. Then data mining is the process of discovering patterns, trends and insights from large data sets. What kind of pattern the data follow or are there any trends present in the data? And uh, basically to discover the patterns or trends or the, uh, the insights from the large data sets, we use various techniques from statistics, machine learning and database systems. And a combination of all these techniques uh, form the data mining tools. So, the basic objective is to extract useful information from large data sets. This is the objective of various data mining tools. You want to acquire information from the data sets and usually we handle large data sets. And then we use this information for making predictions or for making better decisions. Now, broadly you can divide the data mining activities in two parts, descriptive data mining and predictive data mining. In predictive data mining, your objective is 
directing future outcomes based on historical data. It is just uh, like regression techniques. You have uh, say one input variable and one output variable and you are fitting a regression model, simple linear regression model say. And then your objective is on the basis of a given input variable, you want to predict the output variable. This kind of problem is called the predictive data mining. Then we have descriptive data mining. In descriptive data mining, your objective is to summarize and interpret data to understand its underlying patterns and relationships. For example, uh, suppose you have a simple data set on a single variable. Then uh, what is your first step? You uh, define certain descriptive statistics. Say so you obtain its mean, you obtain its variance, etc. So, basically what you do? You summarize the information contained in data and then uh, this summary statistic, this kind of summarization of information also helps you in interpreting the nature of the data. So, such kind of data mining tools are called or such kind of data mining is called descriptive data mining. So, in descriptive data mining, we discover the locations of unexpected structures or relationships, patterns, trends, clusters and outliers in the massive data sets. Say you have big data set and uh, suppose you want to form different groups so that the variables in a group are more or less behaving in a similar fashion. Or you can say that variables uh, in a group are more similar to each other on the basis of certain characteristics of the variables. So you want to form the groups. You want to divide the variables in the form of similar groups or similar kind of clusters. So, this is descriptive data mining or you want to observe if there are certain outliers present in the data certain observations which are behaving differently. So, descriptive data mining helps you in finding such kind of outliers. Then we have predictive data mining. In predictive data mining, what we do? We build models and procedures for regression, classification, pattern recognition or machine learning tasks. Say for example, uh, you form a regression model. Now, you can use that regression model for the prediction purpose or even in classification. Suppose you form some certain classification rule, then if you get a new observation, you observe the characteristic of that particular observation, then on the basis of your past information, your past knowledge, you can predict the class of that observation. Say for example, on the basis of uh, certain measurements like uh, ECG data or the blood pressure or sugar level etc. You have classified is 
set of patients into whether that particular patient has heart disease or not. So, basically what you have? You have a set of patients and uh, you also have the information that whether those patients have heart disease or not and then you take observations on certain variables like their uh, uh, blood pressure, their sugar level, uh, maybe the readings of their TMT test etcetera. And then you form the classification rule. In future, suppose you get a new patient, you take observations on all these input variables. You take, uh, you observe his blood pressure, you go for his TMT test, etcetera. And uh, using your classification rule, you can predict whether that patient has heart disease or not. So, this kind of data mining technique is called predictive data mining. Of course, uh, if you are fitting such kind of model or if you are forming such kind of classification rule, in predictive data mining, then you require predictive accuracy of the models and procedures. So, when you apply this model or this classification procedure to fresh data, then how much accuracy you get, how accurately it predicts the class of that new observation the class of that new patient. So, of course, you require certain measures of predictive accuracy. Uh, in machine learning terminology, you can say that descriptive data mining is unsupervised learning, whereas predictive data mining is supervised learning. I will discuss uh, uh, this unsupervised learning and supervised learning in detail in the next lecture. Now, basically data mining methods uh, are related to models developed in statistics and machine learning. So, the models which we use in data mining methods are not very different from the models which we use in statistics and machine learning. Or you can say that the data mining tools or data mining methods rely on the models developed in statistics and machine learning, such as uh, say regression model or uh, different classification procedures, different clustering procedures, or different data visualization techniques. Then, uh, usually, you have big data or enormous sizes of the data sets. So, when you have enormous sizes of the data sets, say suppose it has a large number of variables involved in the data set and uh, then you have a large number of observations also. Then one of the important tasks of data mining tools is dimensionality reduction you have very high dimensional data. And suppose, uh, although the dimension of the data is very high, but data is basically concentrated around a lower dimensional hyperplane or a lower dimensional space or it may be some nonlinear surface around which the data is concentrated. Then you may like to reduce the dimension of the data. Of course, uh, this is the problem of principal component analysis. Uh, the objective of principal component analysis is to reduce the dimension of the data. And uh, we will discuss uh, this topic in detail in a later lecture. Now, one of the important issue in data mining is scalability. Scalability is basically the algorithm's ability to handle and process large data sets 
efficiently and effectively. Say, since you are handling large data sets and your objective is to get the outcome as fast as possible. So, your algorithm should be like this, it should process the data very fast and it should be efficient also. So, algorithm should remain efficient and accurate as the number of variables and observations increases. It should be fast, it should be efficient and it should be accurate also. Even if you have a large number of variables and even if you are continuously getting the observations, so observations are also increasing. Scalability can be expressed as a function of the data size. The scalability increases as the data size increases. It may be linear or logarithmic or polynomial or exponential. Ideally, means scalability should be linear or sublinear function. That is, time and memory grow proportionally or slower than the data size. So, scalability should be should be proportional to now this is the linear case it is proportional to the data size or it should be sublinear now i discuss some potential applications of data mining so Data mining tools are used in uh, different fields where we get large amount of data and you have to store as well as process large data set. Now, the first application is in marketing. In marketing, suppose you have to predict new purchasing trends or you have to identify loyal customers. Say, is uh, there any change in the pattern of purchases or what is the latest trend in purchases or the customers who have done shopping in the past, whether they are coming back or not, how loyal those customers are. So, you have to identify loyal customers. Then in marketing, this is also important to find associations among customers demographic characteristics. Say people from southern part of India, they consume more rice. So, the customers have this kind of demographic characteristics. People from Punjab or Haryana, they consume more wheat. So, one has to find this kind of association among the customers demographic characteristics. Or predict customers who respond to direct mailings, telemarketing calls, or advertising campaigns, promotions, etc. So, you have to identify such kind of customers. So, that uh, for the future uh, mailing campaign or for future telemarketing calls, you may again contact those customers or the customers who do not respond to such kind of direct mails or calls, you try to convince them by using some other means, so that they also respond. Then market basket analysis, which group of products sell together? If some customer is buying uh, toothpaste, 
how likely is it that he also buys a toothbrush or if some customer is buying computer, how likely is it that he also buys some kind of insurance for his computer or how likely is it that he goes for an extended warranty. So, you want to identify a group of products which sell together. In banking, you want to predict customers likely to change their credit card affiliation. Say, suppose the customer is using the credit card of bank A, then uh, bank B wants to convince the customer that uh, the customer switches over to the credit card of bank B. Then uh, on the basis of uh, different uh, information or different data uh, on the purchases of uh, customer A using the credit card or uh, on the basis of uh, satisfaction rating provided by the customer for the bank A credit card. Bank B may like to predict how likely the customer may change or may switch over to his uh, the bank B's credit card or determine credit card spendings by customer groups. So, where the customer is going to use his credit card for purchases or which group of customers is going to use their credit cards for the purchase of say is airlines ticket or in some uh, shopping mall. Evaluate loan policies using customer characteristics. So, the bank may like to form its loan policies in such a way that more and more customers come and uh, they take loan from the bank. So, they may like to evaluate their loan policies and uh, for changing their loan policies or for modifying their loan policies, they also use the customer's characteristics, the likings of the customer. Predict behavior use of automated tailor machines. Say, when people uh, are in on which days or for in which period more people use ATM machines. So, the bank may like may be interested in predicting such kind of behavior or identify hidden correlations between different financial indicators. How different financial indicators are correlated with each other. In financial markets, so, identify stock trading rules from historical market data. So, you have historical market data and then you may be interested in uh, forming some kind of model or some kind of rule to identify stock tra trading pattern or stock trading rules. Then you may be interested in tracking changes in an investment portfolio and predict price turning points. So, whether there are any changes in an investment portfolio and if so, then you may be interested in predicting the turning points or you may be interested in analyzing volatility patterns in high frequency stock transactions using volume, price and time of each transaction. So, you have some kind of times these data on the volume, price and 
time of each transaction in stock market and then you analyze the volatility pattern of the data. Then another application of uh, data mining is insurance and healthcare. So, in insurance sector, you want to identify characteristics of buyers of new policies and predict which customers will buy new policies. So, you have observations on different characteristics of the buyers, their age, their income, uh, the number of family members in their family or the number of dependents of the buyer and then you want to predict whether the buyer or whether the person will buy a new policy or not. Then claims analysis, say which medical procedures are claimed together. So, the insurance company may be interested in uh, this kind of characteristic. Then identify behavior pattern of risky customers for certain illness. Say which uh, customers on the basis of behavior pattern, which customers are more likely to develop heart disease or uh, which customers are uh, in more risky or more likely to develop certain kind of cancer. So, on the basis of uh, past behavior pattern, past tests, etc., the insurance company may be interested in identifying such kind of customers or identify successful medical treatments and procedures by examining insurance claims and billing data. So, just uh, by examining the insurance claims and billing data, the insurance company may be interested in identifying the successful medical treatments. Uh, then uh, in molecular biology, data mining tools can be used for the collection, organizing and integrate the enormous quantities of data on bioinformatics, functional genomics, proteomics, gene expression monitoring and microarrays. And uh, to analyze these data also, you can use uh, different data mining tools, say for example, for an analyzing amino acid sequences and DNA microarray data, often different data mining tools are used. Or for analyzing gene expression data also, say for example, suppose you have uh, gene expression data and you want to identify say changes in the which particular gene or expression values of which particular gene cause certain kind of disease. So, you may be interested in predicting those genes which cause certain kind of disease. So, for that purpose you can use data mining tools or you want to predict protein structure and identify related proteins. And forensic uh, suppose you are interested in identifying fraudulent behavior in credit card users by looking for transactions that do not fit a particular card holder's buying habits. Say suppose uh, a particular card holder has never used his credit card in some foreign country like USA or France and uh, suddenly it has been observed that the credit card has been used one day in France, the next day in uh, say Thailand, third day in USA. Then definitely this is not a normal pattern. So, you suspect some kind of fraudulent behavior. And then uh, you can also use data mining tools for identifying fraud in insurance and medical claims. Whether the insurance claims or medical claims are genuine or there is some kind of fraud. So, on the basis of past data, or past information, past behavioral pattern, 
one can identify such kind of torts. Then identify instances of tax evasion. So, you can use data mining tools for this purpose. Say to detect illegal activities leading to suspected money laundering operations. Again, this money laundering operations may have some kind of activities which are not normal. So, on the basis of uh, those patterns, one can detect whether these activities are normal or whether these activities are leading to some kind of money laundering operations. Or to identify stock market behaviors that indicate possible insider trading operations. Insider trading means the trading by a person who is uh, either working in that uh, particular company, say suppose uh, somebody who is very much involved in making policies of some company like TCS and uh, suddenly he starts uh, buying TCS shares or he starts selling TCS shares. Then since the person is involved in uh, the policies of the uh, TCS, so this kind of trading may be intentional or he may be knowing whether the stock is going to increase or decrease. So, this kind of trading is illegal and it is called insider trading operation. Then in transportation to determine the distribution schedules among outlets and uh, to analyze loading patterns. Once you analyze the loading patterns, then you can predict the loading pattern and then uh, you can form your uh, policy or you can prepare your infrastructure accordingly. And in sports, uh, identify which players and design plays are most effective at specific points in the game and in relation to combinations of opposing players. So, even in the sports, you can use uh, different data mining techniques. So, the best suited design or the best suited strategy can be formed using data mining techniques. Then uh, you can observe or you can discover the game patterns hidden behind some of the statistics. Then data mining tools are uh, also widely used in astronomy. Say the tools like clustering are used to catalog hundreds of millions of stars and galaxies in the sky using hundreds of attributes such as position, size, shape, age, brightness and color etcetera. And you may have observations on uh, a lot of more variables also. So, using uh, the observations on those variables, you may form different groups or different clusters of stars and galaxies and uh, then you can categorize those stars or galaxies. Identify patterns and relationships of objects in the sky. So, for this purpose also, say how the object is moving, whether the objective is becoming brighter etcetera. So, such kind of patterns can be identified using data mining techniques. Now, we come to data mining and knowledge discovery. Actually, these two fields are closely related fields and uh, both the fields share common goals and methodologies. Many of the tools are common in knowledge discovery and data mining. Uh, knowledge 
Kaudi actually refers to the non-trivial extraction of implicit, previously unknown and potentially useful information from data stored in databases. So, you have data stored in databases and as you know as such just by looking at the data you do not get any information, you do not gain any knowledge. Data has knowledge hidden in it and you have to extract the knowledge and uh, that extraction of knowledge, getting knowledge from the data is the objective of knowledge discovery. Non-trivial extraction of implicit previously unknown and potentially useful information from the data. Data mining basically focuses on application of algorithms and techniques, different tools to extract patterns from data or to extract information from data. So, you may consider data mining as a part of knowledge discovery. Data mining basically provides you different tools for extracting information or for gaining knowledge. Knowledge discovery includes the entire process of discovering useful knowledge from data including data mining as a key component. So, basically data mining or different data mining tools are key component of knowledge discovery. And uh, six primary activities of the knowledge discovery are selecting the target data set and by target data set means different variables which are important for your task, uh, different cases used in data mining or data set. So, you have to select the target data set which set of variables although you have observations on a large number of variables, you have observations on a large number of cases, but you have to target only those variables or only those cases which are important for your objective. Data cleaning, in data cleaning we remove any noise present in the data or if there are any outliers present in the data outlier means the observation not following the usual pattern which is away from the usual pattern. So, then uh, some of the observations may be missing, then either you just leave those observations, say suppose there is a particular case on which and for that particular case you have observations on only a subset of variables, observations on some of the variables is are missing. So, you have two options either leave that particular case, totally leave that particular case or you impute, you estimate those missing observations and impute those observations there and then go for the data analysis. Pre-processing the data, sometimes before the data analysis or before applying any data mining tool, you have to make certain kind of transformations or you have to track time dependent information, so pre-processing of the data. Deciding appropriate data mining tasks, which tasks you have to use, which tasks is are going to serve your purpose. For example, whether you should use regression or you should use different classification tools or clustering methods etcetera. Later on we will discuss all these uh, topics in detail. Then analyzing the clean data using data mining software. So, you also require software for analyzing the data. You need algorithms for data reduction, dimensionality reduction, 
fitting different models, say suppose you are fitting regression model, then definitely you require some algorithm or some software for the fitting the regression model. And suppose your objective is prediction, then you require software for the prediction purpose. Or you want to extract the patterns present in the data, then again you require software for that purpose. Then finally, after obtaining the output or the result, you have to interpret and assess the knowledge obtained from the data mining results. So, you must know how to interpret your output or how to gain knowledge from your data mining results. Now, we come to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the branch of computer science involving the automation of intelligent behavior. And uh, by automation of intelligent behavior means human like thinking and activities, say for decision making or for problem solving, learning, etc. It should behave like human being. So, one has to create machines that perform functions requiring intelligence when performed by people. If the same activity is performed by people, it requires some kind of intelligence and machine should be able to perform that activity with the same kind of intelligence. Then a study of mental faculties through the use of computational models. Although we are using computational models, but it should be able to study the mental faculties. Then a study of the computations that make it possible to perceive, reason and act. And it is a field that seeks to explain and emulate intelligent behavior in terms of computational processes. Doing the computations, uh, whether selecting the model or whether the fitting a model, it should behave like or it should emulate the inter intelligent behavior. Then the approaches of AI can be organized into four categories. The systems that think like humans, the systems that act like human, and the systems that think rationally, and the systems that act rationally. So, these are the four approaches in which AI can be organized. Now, acting humanly, what does it mean or how can you test it, whether the machine is behaving like human being or not. Uh, for this purpose, the uh, turning test was proposed by Alan Turning in 1950. Uh, turning test actually measures a machine's ability to demonstrate human like intelligence. In fact, uh, the machine should do the task or the machine. Uh, should demonstrate the ability to do the task just like a human being. So, it, it has human like intelligence. Then AI is required to pass the turning test and uh, thinking humanly requires the cognitive modeling approach, how the human thinks and uh, thinking rationally requires the laws of thought approach, which is indisputable reasoning processes. Now, objective of turning test is uh, uh, 
evaluate a machine's ability to demonstrate human like intelligence. So, just for example, suppose a human evaluator engages in a natural language conversation with a human and a machine through a computer interface. And the evaluator does not know which one is a human being and which one is machine. So, here is the evaluator and uh, this is your computer and this is your human being and uh, he does not know whether he is interacting with computer or human being. And evaluator's task is to distinguish between the human and the machine. So, he, his main objective is to distinguish between these two just on the basis of conversation. Now, if the machine can fool the evaluator into believing that it is a human a significant portion of the time, say more than 40 percent or more than 60 percent times, the computer can be fool the evaluator and it behaves just like human being. Then it passes the turning test. For example, if the evaluator has given some very complicated computation, say very complicated multiplication which one cannot do uh, very quickly, then of course, the human being will fail. Of course, and then the computer can do it, but still the computer also gives the wrong answer. Then the evaluator will be confused. He would not be able to distinguish between the computer and the human being. Then the turning test led to debates about what constitutes intelligence, consciousness and the nature of human computer interaction. And uh, then uh, it also has the limitations, the machine may rely on superficial tricks or patterns rather than genuine comprehension. Still, machine can befool the evaluator. It relies on superficial tricks or patterns. It does not show its genuine intelligent behavior. Then, uh, Turning test uh, mainly focuses on linguistic abilities and it may not capture other aspects of intelligence. Other aspects are like uh, creativity, human has creativity, but in the turning test you are not observing this aspect or emotional intelligence. The human has emotional intelligence, but in turning test you of course, you cannot observe the emotional intelligence. The applications of data mining, artificial intelligence and knowledge discovery spanned to various fields like healthcare, finance, marketing, banking, uh, bioinformatics, etcetera. Uh, in this lecture, I have discussed the basic concepts of data mining, its uh, various applications in different fields. We have also discussed in brief the concepts of knowledge discovery and artificial intelligence. Uh, in the last, we have discussed the turning test for artificial intelligence uh, just in brief. In the next lecture, we will move to machine learning tools and its uh, relation with the data mining. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I'm interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP, MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO, that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of five a day. That is, you should have five portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately, you could say, 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now, a portion, before we go further, I'll just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium-sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice, which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe three teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went with a five-a-day campaign, which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the five-a-day policy, while some went for expansionary dietary policies, like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for two plus five policy, in which it said that you should consume five por two portions of fruits and five portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables, more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespective of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators. And if there exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I, will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which con conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits. And uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equal into one portion. So data was converted and provided to the users, that is us from the UK Data Health Survey. So the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing 
an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance, body imbalance, that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables. And we did find insignificant results. Apart from that, infectious diseases like HIV, A, HIV AIDS, etc., we found similar insignificant results, indicating that our, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that, we went, uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data, like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health, whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact a women's health more. But this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol. Now after this, we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication, we found, we tried to find two policy implications, what matters and exactly how much portion matters. So as far as how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, five or more portions of fruits that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP. But if you want to have a good mental health, so you can consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. And similarly, has health and total cholesterol is concerned, an individual must to optimally have the impact of consumption. Vegetables have had a very little impact on your health. It only and high BP and uh, you it's seen when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So an optimum consumption of vegetables are recommended, but fruits have a more impact on like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. These fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of but we find that uh, as far as fruit Concern, they have a, they help in regulating your incidence of but it has a trade-off that means there is something negative happening. It Apart from this, it if you ha if you ha have an incidence it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a possibility of getting high cholesterol. And uh, dried fruits as far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It is a portion of salads and its association with self assessment Vegetables in composite, they have an association with good. Research basically says that there is an association between vegetables and various health indicators. And um, an individual, in order to be healthy, must consume five or more portions of of vegetables per day. But fruits have a more impact. From that, all size fruits they have a better impact on your overall measures of blood pressure and cholesterol.